Everybody would like to call to order the Thursday, June 21st. Uh, budget hearing and meeting the Board of Supervisors. We can have a, start with a roll call, please. Supervisor Leopold. Here. Coonerty. Here. Caput. Here. McPherson. Here. Chair Friend. Here. We are going to uh, start with a presentation on the public safety and justice budget categories provided in the proposed budgets, which are pages 249 to 251. Ms. Mowry, welcome back. Good morning, Chair Friend, members of the board. Christina Mowry, the County Budget Manager. Um, so I'm going to give you a brief overview of the public safety and justice budgets category before you consider the budgets today. Um, oh, no. we don't have our presentation up. Just realized that, sorry. We can, I can go over the first slide before we get to it. The public safety and justice budgets include 911, animal control services, um, contribution to Superior Court, County Fire, District Attorney, Emergency Services, Grand Jury, Probation, Public Defender, and the Sheriff Coroner. Mm, just start it up there at the top here. You want me to get it? Oh, Alicia. Yeah, Ms. Steinbrenner, we haven't even received a presentation yet. Before we go to the consent agenda, that will all happen. Okay, and the public safety and justice category expenditures are approximately 146 million for the upcoming fiscal year. This represents 19% of the county budgeted expenditures for fiscal year 1819 and represents a 4.1% increase from the previous fiscal year, which is primarily the increased cost to maintain current operations. Uh, the chart here shows a share of expenditures by department and agency. Uh, the largest expenditures, of course, salaries and benefits, which comprises um, 92 million of the total and supports 583 positions, an increase of almost five positions from the previous fiscal year. Additional expenditures include services and supplies of about 47 million and other charges of six million and uh, fixed assets and some contingencies of less than a million dollars. And here you see the revenue for public safety. It's approximately 63 million uh, this year, or 43% of our total financing uh, or for public safety, uh, with the general fund and other funds <coughs> making up the difference of about 57% to meet the expenditure needs. Um, public safety and justice revenues represent about 11% of the total budgeted revenues of the county. Um, it's comprised of 43 million intergovernmental revenue, uh, almost 11 million in charges for services, um, almost 9 million in taxes, fines, and assessments, and less than a million in licenses and other financing. Additional financing includes about $81 million in general fund dollars, uh, support, and less than 2 million in other funds. Uh, this chart here shows the share of financing by department and agency, and note that both animal services, animal control services, and the grand jury are not represented as they are totally supported by the general fund, which is shown on the next slide. So here you'll see the share of the general fund contribution by department. So as mentioned earlier, it's about $81 million. Uh, the largest uh, section, uh, well, it represents 55% of the total general fund contribution uh, for the county. Um, and here you can see the largest uh, percentage of public safety and justice is the sheriff coroner, 60% of the 81 million. And as noted in other areas, there are still critical unmet needs in public safety, especially relating to the needs for crisis intervention, uh, which the sheriff will discuss further. However, we would like to leave you with a few of the accomplishments for public safety and justice this year, including the opening of the new rehabilitation and reentry center, the Blaine Street reopening, and all of the preparation work for the soon to start construction of the new juvenile hall recreation and seed to table facilities. From improving our emergency operations to serving as first responders, from finding homes to offering low cost or free spay neuter and vaccine services for pets, from representing nearly 10,000 cases of the public defender to continuing to serve the needs of the AB 109 population. The public safety and justice departments serve and protect the citizens of Santa Cruz County. The largest of the public safety and justice departments will provide presentations on the regular agenda. Status quo budget proposals are included on the consent agenda for the 911 communications center, animal control services, contribution to superior court, county fire protection, emergency services, grand jury, and the public defender. 
and the departments are here today, the department heads are here today, are available to answer any questions you Thank may you, have. Thank you, Ms. Mowry. Thank you for that introduction. Do any board members have uh, questions or comments on the consent agenda items? Supervisor Leopold, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I just want to uh, recognize the, those uh, departments who are on uh, the consent agenda for the good work that they do. Um, uh, we get calls around uh, animal services on a regular basis, and they've always been responsive uh, uh, to the, con the questions and concerns raised by constituents. And I'm looking forward to their first Grateful Shelter event on October 20th. Um, that's going to have a Grateful Dead band and dogs and tie dye. So um, keep that marked on your calendar. Uh, our uh, county fire service is uh, is very good, and I always appreciate the way that they work with uh, rural residents in um, our community. Uh, and the Office of Emergency Services is a uh, not well known but a criti critically important part of our uh, uh, public safety infrastructure. And I. Uh, uh, I really appreciate the work there, and um, we we count on them during times of crisis, and they're always there for us. So thank you. We'll now open it up for the community. This is an opportunity for members of the community to address us on uh, the consent agenda, which are items one through seven. Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner, resident of rural Aptos. I actually, when I interrupted you, I was trying to speak about items not on the agenda, on the addenda. So can I have that three minutes? Uh, <laughs> so oral communications will occur after this item. I, I see. All right, thank you very sure. much. Then I'll wait. Um, I would actually like to pull item four from the consent agenda for better public discussion. And I would like to, uh, on item five, I would like to commend the Office of Emergency Services for getting a grant to increase the uh, quality of emergency communication with amateur radio at the, um, the emer County Emergency Communication Center. But I would like to pull item number four for better public discussion. Okay. Um, is there anybody else in the community that'd like to address us on consent items? Okay, um, we'll make item four, we'll just hear it immediately because it'll be a, a brief item. We'll make it 7.1 for the clerk. Thank you. I'm taking time off work to be here, so I appreciate that. Thank you very much. I would move much. the consent agenda as amended. Second. We have a motion from Supervisor Leopold and a second from Supervisor Coonerty. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It passes unanimously. We'll do oral communications now before we do the regular agenda, which would start on 7.1, which would be the public defender. So an opportunity for members of the community to address us on items not on today's agenda, but within the purview of the board. Ms. Starbrenner. Thank you. I'm here to, um, my name is Becky Steinbrunner. I'm an amateur radio operator and a member of ARIES Amateur Radio Emergency Services that provides emergency communication for the county in disaster times and a lot of public service. I want to invite you all to attend this weekend's field day, which is a national um, event wherein um, amateur radio operators across the country put together their emergency skills and equipment and run on um, non-electricity means. And we're having a field day up at uh, the Cal Fire Training Center on Ben Lomond Mountain. And there's another one at Sky Park in Scotts Valley that is being combined with CERT. I have for you a handout that the San Lorenzo Valley Aries Group put together last night. And I'd like to give that to the board for public record. I hope you'll come, thank you. Anybody else for oral communications? Items not on the agenda? Okay, we'll close oral communications. We'll open up, Ms. Steinbrenner, you might wanna want stay close. We'll open up with the first item, which is to approve the 2018-19 proposed budget for county fire protection, including any supplemental budget materials as recommended by the CAO. We have the county fire protection 18-19 proposed budget, the line item detail 
and the CAL, which is the supplemental on pages 337 and 348. Ms. Steinbrenner, you pulled the item? Yes, and thank you. Thank you for expediting it to near the beginning of the session. I'm here to talk about uh, County Fire and to thank them all for their good service. And I'm here to ask you again to fund it with Proposition 172 money, the half cent statewide sales tax that was passed for public safety. This county has chosen ever since that bill was passed in 1992 to give virtually all of it to law enforcement. Law enforcement is also supported by County Service 38. And as you see here, a lot of general fund money. County Fire gets no general fund money. County Fire's budget this year has increased with 3.1%. That's not even the CPI. 3.2 is the CPI. <sighs> Fire behavior is not the same as it's been in the past. Our fire people are telling us this, and we've got to pay attention. We saw it at the Wine Country fires last year. And just because people live in the city, they're not gonna be safe. The concrete jungles are now just as vulnerable as those who live out in the wildland urban interface. I'm asking you to take a break from what Susan Mariello for years supported as favored funding for law enforcement with this money. This, this was brought out in the recent grand jury report, data-driven budgeting, released June 7th. Please, now's the time to make a change and fund our county fire department. If we don't, and a fire comes through, similar to what happened with the wine country, how are you gonna look your constituents in the eye? and say, I'm sorry, we had $17 million of which we could have given county fire some, but we chose not to. In the report, it says for this budget, staffing at two per engine is below the National Fire Protection Association recommended of four per engine. If we have a fire that comes through, and destroys multi-million proper dollar properties out in the wildland, what do you think the insurance companies are gonna to say to you? This could be considered malfeasance when you've got the money to give county fire but continually refuse to fund it. I was here when Scott Jalbert retired and he asked you to fund county fire and you still haven't done it. And adding on another tax for fire prevention out in the wildland is not the answer. The county has the money with Proposition 172 money, giving it millions to corrections, 10 million to corrections, criminal prosecutions, two and a half million, juvenile hall, almost one million, operations for the sheriff, almost three million, zero to county fire. This Thank is unacceptable and it simply must change. Thank right. you. Thank you. Anybody else like to address us on the county fire item? Thank you for waiting. Uh, first of all, on an entirely different matter, I wanted to thank you, and my husband wants to thank you for now live streaming your meetings. He can watch the World Cup, and I can watch your budget hearings. <laughs> <laughs> Glad we're keeping the family together. Yeah. Yes, yes, <laughs> very helpful. Um, I'm Kay Archer Bowden, and I represent the homeowners associations at Pajaro Dunes, and I'm here as I am every year to thank Cal Fire for the um, the way they treat people out there and the way they respond to calls for service. Uh, we've been very happy with the uh, service that they, that they give, with the people that they uh, assign out there, and we are particularly happy, although we're sad to know that she's been promoted and we're gonna lose her, uh, as the analyst, um, Ginny Petras, who has done an outstanding job for years. I always feel like we ought to publish the kind of material that she gives to the committee to consider for understanding the budget. She does a fabulous job, and we're really gonna miss her. Anyway, uh, that's it, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else on the county fire item? We'll bring it back to the board. Any questions or comments from board members or a motion? Supervisor Leopold. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, you know, I've been recently contacted by the Santa Clara Fire Safe Council 
um, about the use of fire cameras in the in the summit area. I've checked with Chief Larkin about the, whether they'd be a valuable tool, and I'd like to give some uh, uh, to make a motion to approve the elements of uh, uh, of the uh, county fire uh, budget. Uh, with additional direction to look at up to $5,000 being used for these cameras. Uh, we'll can check with Chief Larkin, and um, um, it would be, it, it's, a, it's a very useful way to be able to look over large wildlife areas and be able to see when a fire is happening be, be, uh, because there aren't enough people around. Second that. There's a motion from Supervisor Leopold and a second from Supervisor Coonerty. The additional directions understood by CO. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. We're, we're going to uh, do a slight reordering of the regular agenda at this point in order to accommodate a scheduling conflict. We're going to start with the Sheriff's Corner budget. So we're going to take item 10 now as item uh, 7.2, I guess, on the, on the numbering here, or 8, whatever is easier for you from a numbering perspective, is to consider the 2018-19 proposed, proposed budgets for the Sheriff Corner, including all supplemental budget materials as provided in the budget documents. We have the 18-19 proposed budget, the line item detail, the supplemental budget, the continuing agreements list, the unified fee schedule. Good morning, uh, Sheriff Hart. Good morning, Chair Friend, Board of Supervisors, Jim Hart, Sheriff Corner. It's a pleasure to be here this morning to talk to you about our 2018-19 budget. With me is my Corrections Chief, Jeremy Vrinsky. And before I, I get into the, uh, before I get into our proposed 18-19 budget, I, I just want to talk to you about some of the objectives that we had set in our last budget cycle and, and what the outcome of those objectives were. And the first thing I want to touch on is the restoring of our deputy sheriffs. Uh, as you know, during the recession, we lost a whole bunch of deputies uh, because of uh, lack of funding. And so with your board's help and the help from the CAO's office, we've been able to gradually over the last four years restore all of those deputy sheriffs. And now we have many more deputies on the street. We have them on our gang teams and our drug teams, and we've opened up some new substations, one in Boulder Creek and one on the North Coast. And so we have, we have more staffing in the neighborhoods and uh, adding a school resource officer to San Lorenzo Valley High School has been very helpful as well. And staffing doesn't solve all problems, but it certainly helps. And uh, I can say that our crime rates are way down and our solve rates are up and, and you need people in order to accomplish that. So I wanted to acknowledge you guys for your help on, on getting us fully restored. The other, another thing that we wanted to work on and that we did work on last year was creating our division of reentry in our county jail system in partnership with County Mental Health. And that team has been f operational now for the last six months and they're doing some great work. They're, they've, they've, they're diverting people straight from jail into treatment. They've done that over a, with a, over 100 individuals. They're creating reentry plans. Uh, they're providing case management and they're making a big difference for people who are transitioning from our jail system into our community. And I'm really proud of that program. Uh, something else that uh, we worked on last year that, that you had approved is pursuing our accreditation for DNA services. And this is gonna be about a three year process. Last year you approved a lab director position and in this uh, budget cycle we're asking the board to approve funding that lab director position. Uh, as many of you uh, know, because you were there, we opened uh, our re Roundtree Reentry and Rehabilitation Center, which is a 64-bed men's facility out at the Roundtree campus, and that project was completed. Uh, we've also continued providing our patrol staff with crisis intervention team training. And when, when we look at the mental health challenges that we're having, not only in the county, but in our four cities, uh, it, I, I haven't seen anything like this in my 30-year career. My, my deputies are responding about 10 times a day to people who are in serious mental health crisis. And I'm sure the city of Santa Cruz is doing at least that as is Watsonville. And so to, to have our deputies receive this specialized training and our police officers uh, has been fantastic. And, and coming to positive resolutions on these, on these high risk, high crisis cases, uh, it's proving that this crisis intervention team training is uh, very, very good. As you might recall, we had a pretty spirited conversation in my last budget hearing about the use of the Blaine Street facility. And you asked that I do a utilization study at that time. Uh, we did that. 
and uh, we can all concluded that the best use of that facility was for it to remain a women's jail. And then with your board's approval and uh, authorization from the, the CAO as well, we were able to get some dollars and uh, increase and upgrade our security at that jail. And I'm happy to say that, that today that that jail is populated by women, being used by women. There's some great programming going on there. And we're also doing things like family visitation and, and uh, it, it's up and running and doing well. And then the last thing I wanted to touch on was just the restoration of our canine program. We had lost our canines over the course of time due to a number of reasons, uh, but we were able to add a supervisor to that team, uh, put two deputies in there, and we have three dogs working. And so we have a canine on duty uh, every night of the week. So moving into our 18-19 budget, you can see what our revenues and expenditures are anticipated to be. We have about a 5% increase in our expenditures, and that's mostly because of negotiated salary and benefit increases. But we're looking at a total budget this year of about $108 million. And going into this budget cycle, I, my goal was, was to not have a lot of ask. What I really wanted to do was maintain some key areas, and that's in overtime, training, services and supplies, and vehicle replacement. I also, uh, a goal was to continue our three-year process of DNA certification. And uh, funding and hiring that lab director is gonna be a, an important piece of, of that, which I'm asking for in this budget, and I'll talk to you about in a few minutes. I also wanna add body-worn cameras and corrections, and then continue funding our recovery center. So moving into maintaining our overtime training services and supplies, there is a slight increase that you may have noticed in our medical budget and that's because we are opening the new jail facility where we'll have about 150 men out at Roundtree and some of them have medical needs and they have uh, medications that they have to take and so we need medical professionals on site to handle that. Uh, maintaining our patrol fleet has been an issue over the years. We, uh, during the recession, we went five years without replacing a patrol car and it's critical that we have our deputies driving cars that are safe so that they can actually get to the calls for service that they're, they're being asked to respond to. And so I'm really happy that now all of our patrol fleet is on a four-year four replacement schedule. And then uh, I, I keep referring to the recession, but, but in my mind, it's just a short time ago. And, and we lost all of our training as well. And, and when deputies aren't getting training, uh, things come up and so we're, we're now back to a full training cycle where every deputy sheriff working in, a, in patrol gets about a hundred hours a year of in-service training and then we also have ongoing crisis intervention team training for new employees and uh, trying to catch up with some other staff that haven't had it yet and on the, on the CIT training I, I really want to acknowledge county mental health and specifically Pam Rogers Wyman she did a wonderful job in putting together a class that has been accredited and certified by the California Police officer standard and training and it's a it's a 24-hour class for three consecutive days and, and Pam did a great job on that and I, th I think we have uh, three classes planned this fiscal year so moving into body-worn cameras and corrections we know that, that these cameras are very valuable we we've had these cameras in operation in our on our law enforcement side now for about a year and a half so our patrol folks, our investigators, our, our gang and drug team folks all wear these body cameras. And we're taking about 4,500 video segments a month. And, and what I can say about these video segments is that when you have a critical incident or you have a citizen's complaint, to be able to refer back to that video segment is, is very valuable in determining what was going on in that incident. And it doesn't always tell us the whole story, but it gives us a very good idea of what's occurring. And, in, and after having watched many video segments, I'm, I'm clear that people behave better when they're being videotaped. They, they just do. Um, in corrections, we have a need because we, we do have a, a decent video system in our jails, but, but because of the way the, the jail was built, there's areas that aren't under surveillance. And then by, by law, there's certain areas that can't be under surveillance. And so when we have a critical incident occur in the jail and it's in an area that's not being recorded, we really don't know what happened other than what the incarcerated people are telling us and what our staff is telling us. And so to have these body-worn cameras that's collecting both video and audio in corrections, it's gonna protect our staff and it's gonna protect incarcerated people. 
We're looking at adding on to our existing contract that we're using on the law enforcement side. It's about $93,000, and we've completed our policy, and we're currently working with the union and uh, getting their input uh, about these cameras and about our policy. As far as the DNA laboratory goes, I, I think uh, last year I spoke to you a little bit about this, and the, the DNA is not new, but it's, it's something that uh, it would be new to our agency. Right now, we, when we submit, or we have a case where DNA is collected, we're very limited by Department of Justice rules on what types of crimes we can submit on and how many samples we can submit. And there's a system backlog where uh, even on priority cases, it takes up to six weeks to get a return on, on a DNA case. And on lower priority cases like residential burglary, it could take many months to get a return. And so uh, when, once our, our lab is implemented, we'll be able to get returns on our cases within 48 hours, and that's going to result in a safer community. It's going to result in suspects being identified earlier and being taken off the street. And it's going to bring justice for the victims and the survivors of some of these violent crimes that we see occur around our county. Uh, filling the lab director position that you authorized last year is a critical piece to this, and, and that's going to get us to DNA certification by 2021. Moving on to the recovery center, I've talked to you several times about the recovery center, and it's located on jail property. We, we began this uh, on a federal grant on June 1st of 2015, and that grant expired in December of 2017. Uh, it's we're, we're asking for a $634,000 contract with Janice of Santa Cruz. They've been our service provider there for the last three years, and they've been a tremendous partner in this endeavor, and they do a really great job. And not only do they take care of the people that are there, but they also refer these folks to treatment services afterward, and there's many people who have accepted those treatment referrals. Uh, when we... Uh, when we first started the program, we were only taking public inebriants. We have since expanded to first-time DUI offenders as well as people who are under the influence of drugs. And for many of these people, they're in much more of a medical crisis than they are a criminal justice crisis. When somebody drinks too much alcohol, I, I, I don't think that's so much of a criminal justice issue as it is a medical issue, and, and, and Janice is able to provide the service that these folks need. In our original grant application, we had set a goal of diverting 20% of public inebriate arrests to the recovery center. And I'm really happy to say that right now we're diverting 52% of people who are arrested for those offenses, being under the influence of drugs, drunk driving, and drunk in public. 52% of those people are being diverted to the recovery center. And that comes out to about 175 to 200 people a month and when you put that over a year's time, it's over 2,000 people being diverted from a jail system into really more of a treatment system. And, and not only is, it, is that good for uh, the criminal justice system and for the people who are being served, but it's saving literally thousands of hours of deputy sheriff and police officer time. It takes about an hour to book somebody in a county jail, and it takes seven minutes to drop them off at the recovery center. And for me, when I have a deputy bring in somebody, say, from Boulder Creek, and that region is not being patrolled, to save that hour to get that deputy back on the street is critical to our operations. And I, I want to acknowledge the county commitment and the board's commitment to alternatives to incarceration for these low-level offenses. Encouraging people to get treatment rather than putting them in jail is the best way to, to treat this, this group of people. So thank you for that. I want to talk to you a little bit about some future needs, and the, and the first is school resource officers. Right now, we do a cost-sharing program with three school districts, pa Pajaro Valley, Santa Cruz City Schools, and the San Lorenzo Valley Unified School District. And each district pays a portion of their school resource officer, and then the county pays a portion. And what, what we've seen during down budget cycles, and I, I've been through several down budget cycles in my 30 years, is, is that positions that are considered ancillary positions are the first to go, both in the schools and in the county government. And we have to look at these school resource officers as not being ancillary positions. We have to look at these as frontline law enforcement who are keeping our kids safe. And, and with that, we need to take on that financial burden and, and find a funding source where regardless of what the, what the budget situation is, is that we have deputy sheriffs in our three high schools 
so that they can uh, not only work with the administration, but work with the kids and head off small problems bef before they become bigger problems. This is a huge conversation that's going on around the state and the country as far as school safety, and I, I think we really need to be committed to it. There are federal grants available, but right now, uh, applying for federal grants is not an option for us. And that's because uh, they're forcing us to commit to working with immigration uh, if we apply and receive federal funding. And I think we're all committed to not doing that. And I, I recently signed a declaration in support of Attorney General Becerra's attempt to have a court reverse that decision by the federal government, but that's, that's in the courts right now. And so I, I don't think we can wait around for the courts to make a decision on that. We have to commit to, 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 to school safety. And the last thing I wanna to talk to you about on our future needs is, is something that is really impacting not just our county, but every coastal county on the western seaboard. And that's uh, our mental illness, uh, homeless, and substance use disorder population. Uh, like I said, our, uh, our deputies are responding 10 times a day to people in critical situations, people who are, who are attempting suicide, who are walking out of traffic, who are bringing harm to others. And uh, I, th I think the county does a really good job and, and has effective mental health, homeless, and substance use programs uh, for people in, who live in the county as well as for people who live in the four cities who want help. And there's a big difference there for people who want help and people who don't. And so there's a lot of services available for those who want help, but we've, we've identified a gap for people who act out in a threatening manner. Uh, their, their behavior is so far outside of the social norms that it, it can't be tolerated. We, we recently did a survey with the downtown, the Santa Cruz Downtown Business Owners Association, and we asked them a series of questions. And one of the questions was, is has any time in the last 12 months, has your business been closed down due to somebody uh, acting uh, in a violent manner? And almost 50% of the business owners said that they ha they've had to close their business one to three times in the last 12 months because of that. And so, and, and this group is, they're, they're very challenging in that, it, that they refuse treatment. We offer them treatment, they refuse treatment, and they have repeated encounters with law enforcement and the courts. And their behavior escalates. They might get brought in the first few times on a, a very minor charge, but their, their behavior eventually escalates, and there's no intervention uh, for these folks because of the, the low-level crimes that they're committing until they actually go out and harm somebody. Uh, so I'm, I'm here to say that I, I'm willing to utilize the limited resources that I have in our jails and with our staff to get these people the help that they need. But I'm gonna need additional money. I'm gonna need additional funding to get this done and not just law enforcement, but we need clinicians out there working with law enforcement, both on the substance use disorder side and the, and the mental illness side. And I'm, I'm willing to take the lead on this, and I would love to sit down with, with one or all of you to discuss ways that we could try to fund something like this. But what we see is uh, these people get brought in on low-end offenses. There's not great communication between the other law enforcement agencies and mental health providers. And, and these folks slip through the system, they leave our jail, and then they go out and they co commit a violent offense. But I think there's a way of putting a team together with deputy sheriffs, with mental health clinicians, uh, who can work in the four cities, work in the unincorporated area of the county, receive referrals from local law enforcement, receive referrals from local clinicians, as well as community members, and do early intervention and case management for people whose behavior is escalating and may become violent. And improving the safety in our community uh, and, and for our community and our visitors and allowing them to enjoy our shopping and our restaurants and our open spaces, parks and beaches, without fear has to be a priority. So with that, I'm, I'm asking you to approve the proposed budget for the Sheriff's Office, including any supplemental materials as recommended by the County Administrative Officer. Our reference pages are listed, and I'm happy to answer any questions or listen to any comments you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Sheriff Hart. Uh, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, uh, Sheriff Hart, for the presentation. Um, I wanted to thank you about a, a couple different things uh, to start off. 
One, um, most importantly to me, is um, the action of you and your office uh, around the uptick in violence we saw in the SoCal Drive corridor. Um, this is an uh, area that has been, that, that was without problems for many years. Um, and in a very short period of time, there were a number of shootings, um, attempted shootings, a young man died. And the response from you and, and your office was extraordinary. You put the resources there, you used new technology, you met with people, and I'm pleased to say that we, that, that has effectively capped um, the violence that we saw there during the month of March and April. Uh, and when you uh, spoke to 150 members of the community uh, uh, about it, um, and could, and spoke very eloquently, I thought, um, about the hardworking people that live in Emerald Bay apartments, to not demonize uh, the people who live there, to acknowledge that the person who died wasn't uh, a gang member, um, and and to humanize people that we that is very easily that people could say they're the other. Um, was uh, made me proud to be a Santa Cruz County resident. Thank you. Um, and I, I just want to acknowledge that and the work of your staff in, in doing that. It's, uh, we still have a lot of work to do there. We're working with the Youth Violence Prevention Task Force uh, to provide some programming um, to, to have positive pro-social activities for young people. But when, when you see an uptick in violence and you work very hard to, to respond to it, 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 it deserves special mention. So Thank I just you. wanted to say that. Um, I also appreciate the work that, uh, that your staff did on the alcohol nuisance abatement ordinance, and I'm looking forward to uh, future success uh, with that program. Um, I also uh, appreciate the participation um, that your office has provided to the Justice and Gender Task Force, uh, which is, has been a, a series of great conversations uh, and more work to be done there. Uh, but uh, Cynthia Chase, who's participating, Craig Wilson, who's a participated, um, they've offered a lot uh, to the group, and I, and I think it's, it's helped people understand uh, issues. Um, I also was, uh, um, I was very happy when you took the, a leadership position in the state around SB 54, around uh, the sanctuary um, cities legislation uh, to, to, to ensure that we had a, a consistent uh, effort across the state about uh, protecting immigrant communities uh, and not uh, partnering with forces that uh, would seek to, to drive wedges in communities. And um, I know that had to take you a little bit outside your comfort zone with your peers, um, but I think it's a, it's a great reflection of where we are as a community, uh, and I appreciate you taking that, um, um, that step forward. Uh, also, the creation of the Division of Reentry Services uh, last year um, in, in your remarks, you talked about alternatives to incarceration, um, and it reminded me that, uh, that uh, uh, Professor Craig Haney, who is a national expert on, on prison systems, uh, came to that uh, SoCal Drive corridor mo meeting, and he walked away incredibly impressed. He goes, I, I thought uh, Jim Hart and Craig Wilson were sociology professors, the way that they were talking, uh, because, and, and, and the way you look at um, um, uh, people uh, and look to, to address the core problems and not just have a mentality of throw them in a jail cell and things will get better, uh, I think makes a big difference. And the Division of Reentry Services, I think, is path-breaking for a county um, sheriff's department and correction system, and I think it, it's going to pay great dividends. Thank and you. I appreciated the, respo uh, the response from, uh, that you gave to last year's budget hearing and reopening the Blaine Street facility. And that's, uh, th that is a very useful facility for women and part of the, the concern that we have about gender responsiveness, and I think that really hits that. And the Roundtree Rehabilitation and Reentry Facility, the new one, um, is also a great example of, uh, of, the, of the kind of work we're doing to, to make sure that we're that we don't just hold people for a period of time and then put them back out in the community and hope that they do better, but really try to work with them when they're, when, uh, they're incarcerated to help turn people around. And that's a long-term um, uh, public safety strategy. So all those things, I just wanted to uh, express my appreciation. Thank you. Um, 
the, uh, the, the efforts that you talked about in terms of mental health uh, seem very critical. Um, when I hear something, 10 calls a day, uh, so that's over 300 calls a month, um, that's a lot of work that we're asking um, your officers uh, to do. And I know we have uh, uh, mental health liaisons. Uh, you've done great work in terms of uh, training your staff around de-escalation. Uh, but uh, this idea of having a sheriff-driven uh, mental health response, I wonder if you could say a little bit more. Are there examples in, uh, around the state or the country that we could look to for something like that? There's, there's, a, uh, there's an example in Southern California, uh, on the, more on the mental health issue. Uh, th th that agency doesn't have the homeless uh, challenge that we have. Uh, so a lot of their work is done in apartments and in houses and, and not out on, on the street. But it's really trying to uh, convince people either through uh, counseling and therapy or just talking to them, but convince them to get help or using other remedies like the courts and the district attorney and uh, the public defender uh, and sometimes the jail in order to uh, stop somebody's behavior before it gets worse. I, I, I'm, I'm very committed to not over-incarcerating people, and I think I've displayed that over the last four years. However, with some people, having that intervention, having that disruption in time might prevent them from committing a crime where they're going to wind up in state prison and we're going to have somebody who is injured or hurt or, or been victimized. And so I think we can use our jail in a smart manner and then use our clinicians and our deputy sheriffs and, and, and the entire justice system to convince these people that uh, the behavior is unacceptable and it needs to stop and, and then offer them treatment as well. So are, are, would these be additional officers and these uh, clinicians, would they be going out with the existing force or would they be only responding to those calls you get each day? Yeah, it would be a standalone team uh, working with mental health clinician, substance use clinician, law enforcement. Uh, we would, uh, I see a lot of interventions occurring at the jail because this group does cycle in and out of the jail. And so meeting with these people at the jail, setting expectations, setting behavior standards, um, letting them know that, that uh, we're gonna be there should they be acting out or harming somebody. And then doing a lot of very intense supervision out in the field. I, I think it's something that uh, that necessarily hasn't been tried that, that I've seen in, in other areas, but it makes a lot of sense that if, if you're checking in with somebody who is escalating and acting out and you're checking with that person on a daily basis, uh, I think there's ways that we can prevent crimes and prevent injuries before they happen. And would this be just for the unincorporated area? Would it be countywide? I mean, how, what, what's your vision for that? Yeah, my vision for this is that this group would go anywhere in the county, you know, the, inside the four cities and uh, in, in the unincorporated area of the county. Uh, the city of Santa Cruz obviously has a very concentrated issue there in the downtown, uh, as well as up Highway 9. Uh, whereas the county, we, we have similar challenges, but it's just more dispersed over a long, uh, over a large area. And so, you know, I, I, we, we had a, a community member that was uh, attacked and seriously injured at Moran Beach, uh, a parking lot a few weeks ago. And, and we've had, I, I could probably cite 20 cases over the last six months where this type of behavior has occurred. And so, uh, to answer your question, I think this group would provide services anywhere in Santa Cruz County, including the four cities. Yeah, well, I, I, can, I know the areas in my uh, district, and I'm sure my colleagues know the areas in their district, um, um, but this, these resources would be critically important um, because uh, sometimes behavior isn't criminal, but it's, it's definitely impactful. Um, and, and there's times, excuse me for interrupting, but there's times where we have law enforcement officers who will come to their supervisor or come to one of our assigned mental health clinicians in patrol and say, hey, this guy hasn't, hasn't done anything yet, but his behavior is really scaring people and it's really escalating. And some people, sometimes we just throw up our hands and say, what can we do? Well, I think that's a, a person or a situation where we could assign that team to go out and, and talk to him. If he's housed, we could talk to uh, roommates or family members and see how, what we could do as a group uh, to prevent any future harm from occurring. Well, I would really, um, uh, I think we should talk about this um, 
and uh, and give some direction to our county administrative officer to to work on this because these um, if we if we if I were to ask my constituents uh, what their concerns would be their cons the, you know the, we're fortunate that we don't have violent crime as a major factor in our uh, in uh, within public safety but nuisance crimes uh, pr small property crimes are prevalent and mental health issues are get talked about a lot. Um, and I receive emails every week from people who are saying, help us out in Moran Lake, help us out uh, by the 7-Eleven, help us out on uh, uh, near uh, Anna Jean Cummings Park. That's right. Uh, you know these areas because that's where your officers respond. So I'd be very interested in looking about how this program can be created. Uh, we, we answer somewhere in the neighborhood of 120,000 uh, 120, calls for service, and a vast majority of those calls for service, substance use disorder, homelessness, and mental illness touches, or all three in some cases, touches that call for service in a, in a majority of those calls for service. Yeah, well, I, I think it builds on what, what I would say is an unqualified success uh, around the recovery center, where you're diverting 52% of, of the people who would come, be coming in for those uh, for those actions, that's to me is a great success uh, because we should be getting people treatment rather than um, jail time. That's right. um, so I, I look forward to that discussion when it comes back uh, to us. Thank you. Thank you for your work, and uh, I'll just recognize Kathy Sams, who's here, oh. who I know did all the financial work to put this <laughs> together. Uh, thanks for keeping them straight. <laughs> thanks, Supervisor Leopold. Supervisor Coonerty. Yeah. Um, sort of it follows the same lines. I imagine you're going to hear the same thing, which is uh, I really appreciate the good work that's being done both in the community and in the facilities this year. And when you look at the list of accomplishments, uh, it's, it's remarkable and it's going to have benefits not just, you know, immediately, but potentially for decades uh, in, this, in this county. And so I want to thank you for both uh, being on the forefront of what's good for our community, but also what, what will be good for our community over the long period of time. Thank you. And hopefully as a model for other communities as we try to figure out a new way to do uh, policing and incarceration in this country. And then, um, yeah, I mean, I think the unmet need that you've identified is certainly what I hear the most uh, concern about from the community on a daily basis. And um, I think we need to act. Uh, I think the collaboration between you and mental health is exactly what's needed um, because there's there are folks uh, who just need a, a direction towards services uh, then there's folks who need um, to, to have clear accountability for their actions and then they then hopefully they can get to the point where they can access services um, so I'm very interested in moving forward as quickly as possible and finding the resources in order to make this happen and I appreciate you uh, taking the leadership on this, and I'm 100% in to, to figure out what we can do to, to make it happen. Great, thank you. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, I want to thank you for your accomplishments to repeat those, the uh, crisis intervention, the Blaine Street uh, rec uh, facility, the recovery center, um, very impressive. And it's, I have, I've always thought that public safety is a top priority of any government. Um, people feel safe, uh, the community feels safe, and they're better for it. Um, and this implementation of what we need to do in the future, I think you've got your eye right on the right place. Um, and if some of those issues that you have said, is, uh, if you'll excuse the pun, uh, that was a sobering report about 10 times a day for crisis intervention. Uh, this is a team sport. Uh, public safety is a team sport, and I think that we do have to have the Health and Human Services cooperate with what uh, you're doing um, to make this a safer community. Uh, this board in this county has really put a lot of effort into some early intervention for uh, families and so forth, so in the hopes of having better family life for those in, that are being served, but then also a long-term uh, better outlook for the kids of today, for the adults of tomorrow. But um, I think the to get, get some alternatives to incarceration um, in this medical crisis, as you said, is, is this is as much a medical crisis as it is a criminal justice crisis. And to get to this uh, collaborative effort to try to resolve it, it seems to me that 
one of the biggest things we need, uh, aside from personnel, but the facilities. I mean, we are short on facilities, and I would like to get a gauge, you know, when we, to get the human services, health services together with uh, the sheriff's office, probation, whoever, to realistically see what, what we, how many services or what facilities do we need to serve these people in need. Um, I, um, I don't know, I, we, we don't have enough. We know that the, the mental health, uh, the number of beds we have is just a fraction of our need. And um, this is upon us with uh, the mental health crisis that we have, we've seen with so many people in our, our society and the homeless situation. Um, let's, we're, if we address this in a collaborative effort, uh, we can find out what to do, but where to serve them, if you will. Uh, so I'd like to try to get a, a sense of what facilities do we need in a, in a cooperative effort with health services and human services um, to see, you know, realistically what we might be able to do. Um, and then, um, on the school, it's, it's very much well received that uh, you have officers uh, during school hours at high school campuses. And, uh, you know, um, I don't want to wait to the next crisis. And I, this is a preventative measure uh, that is just a horrific scene that we see too much, uh, once too much, uh, many times, too many times. Uh, but I would, through, um, I'm just thinking of going through as an, on the executive committee of the California State Association of Counties to see how we might um, put something together that we can get legislation that we provide, the state helps us in providing those types of services for school campuses. Um, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how we'd go about it, but again, it would be a cooperative effort between the schools and law enforcement to see make sure that we have this on every high school campus in the state of California. Um, we should do that now, get ahead of it, before we see the next catastrophe that might happen in this state or somewhere else. Um, but I just wanna thank you for everything that you have done. Um, and I know that uh, it, it's in the budget now, but I, and a, problem, or a, a short, shortfall has been the amount of personnel in jail facilities. You've had seven, I think you had seven vacancies and you're working on to, obviously to get that filled. Where are we in that situation right now? Um, yeah, so our, our corrections uh, personnel, we have a number off on injuries right now. We have about 15 people that are off. And then we have seven vacancies, and, and we have, uh, I believe there's six people in background investigations to fill those seven vacancies. And then we're working with risk management and uh, our staff to try to get these people back to being healthy and, and getting back to work. So um, I, I, I foresee us hiring about five or six more in the next six to eight weeks, and, and that will be a, a, a bit of a, a shot in the arm for the correction staff. Great, well, I, I just, in general, r really appreciate your, uh, proactive, coordinated view of how to resolve some of these things and not have the sheriff's office be a response agency, but one that helps people before they get in a crisis situation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Caput. Uh, welcome, it's good to see you here and yep. uh, have, you know, a good conversation. Uh, um, it said in there uh, on funding, uh, this is a specific one, uh, status quo on overtime pay. But has overtime pay actually gone down a little from, is it uh, status quo from last year or two or three years ago? Uh, because we did hire more sheriff deputies about, what, two to three years ago? Yeah, so we, we've, we've kind of, we've continually added deputies over the last few years. Um, we, we do have about the same overtime budget. Uh, today we have 22 people in training, so, so those, those 22 people aren't, filling a beat, so to speak, by themselves. They're, they're in the process of being trained, and so um, we're, we're not seeing a big reduction in overtime right now because we've had to hire so many people and they're, they're going through the process to become solo beat deputies. Okay. And uh, this is kind of hypothetical, but it's also specific to something that happened uh, in general in the, uh, the county. Uh, the cooperation, the uh, working with other agencies like the Highway Patrol and the, uh, the sheriffs, of course, and then the local police. 
and we could probably even add somebody else, uh, you know, uh, the state agency of public safety. Uh, someone is um, going to jump off of an overpass, and it's in the unincorporated area. But is is that? How do you work that out? And who actually, uh, in the in this specific case, <coughs> talked them from uh, talked them out of uh, from jumping? Uh, is it the CHP? Is it the uh, local police? Is, or is it you? You're all working together. And then who actually is trying to talk them down? Yeah, so it, it depends where it occurs and in, in which jurisdiction. But we, we this is, uh, unfortunately, this happens several times a year. Right. And so we have crisis negotiators that will come in and talk to the person. Uh, we have um, highway patrol will shut down the highways and the roads. Uh, if somebody's on a, on a on a bridge or something, and uh, whoever's in the area, uh, if it's Santa Cruz PD or Capitola or CHP, they'll, they'll help uh, secure the area, and 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 then we'll get our staff out there to talk to the person. But really, as first responders, they we all have a, a, a very basic um, tool set that that we're provided in, in our training, and so any deputy, any police officer can start that conversation, and then when somebody who's more trained shows up, they can take that conversation over. Right. And uh, so uh, do you actually, is it more than one person that does the talking, or you, do you have somebody that actually specializes in, uh, that would be mental health and, you know, talking to somebody? And then I guess sometimes it could be the, uh, maybe getting a family member to come and help and try, or a friend or a, somebody to try to get them to come down from, you know, not jumping. Yeah, so all of those scenarios you just described could happen. If, if we have a mental health clinician uh, who's working at that moment and, and he or she can respond out, they're great. They'll, they'll come out and help us out. Uh, if we can get family there to help out, that's really good too. So it's, it's really whatever we have at our disposal or what's available, we'll, we're happy to use. And we, and we do have deputies who have special training uh, in talking people who are, are talking with people who are in serious crisis like you described. And then uh, where do you actually take them at that point? Because uh, if you just take them and put them in a cell, of course, that's not going to do much uh, at that time. Where, where, do you take them first to like uh, the hospital or mental health uh, facility? Uh, where, where do they end up, uh, let's say, for that night? At, at, after a few hours, where do they actually end up? Yeah, so assuming they haven't sustained any injuries, you know, from jumping or something like that, they, they, we will take them to the Behavioral Health Center on, across from Harbor High School. Yeah. And uh, they'll, they'll be committed there for up to 72 hours. And then if a doctor feels like they need to stay longer or go to a, a little more restrictive facility, they'll do that. There's, there's going to be no criminal charges pending against that person, so jail would not be an appropriate place for them. Um, so they would, they would go to a, a crisis stabilization center, essentially. You bet. So, anyway, thank you, and uh, uh, you know, be safe on the job too. Uh, you, you have a, you know, some tough situations that uh, probably come up uh, quite frequent, you know, frequently, um, and uh, you never know what the next one's going to be and how it's going to turn out. So that's right, and we we have great personnel who do a wonderful job every single day. So thank you. Yeah. You bet. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Caput. Um, I don't have much to add for you guys other than I appreciate, obviously, the work you do and appreciate the fact that you're a national model for law enforcement uh, without question, both from the administrative staff up to the sworn staff, up to the executive staff, uh, both in corrections and in patrol. Um, you're leading the way. If, I wish a lot of agencies would follow your model, Sheriff Hart. Thank you. Same, same with you, Chief Frinsky, the work that you've done in both the jail and, and other places throughout the department. Um, without question, it's a model for the country. Uh, we'll open up for the community. It's an opportunity for members of the community to address us on the sheriff's budget. A lot of people, but no words. <laughs> must be pleased. So we'll bring it back to the board for action. I think Supervisor Leopold had a motion. Yes, I, I would like to move the recommended actions, but also direct our county administrative officer to come back on last day uh, with some financing strategies so we can look at uh, the creation of the program that, uh, that Sheriff Hart talked about, um, both uh, on the mental health and the school resource officers. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Yeah. A motion from Supervisor Leopold, a second from Supervisor McPherson. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. 
Opposed? It passes unanimously. Thank you both. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll now move on to the probation department. After the probation department, we'll take the district attorney. The probation department is item nine. That's to consider the 2018-19 proposed budgets for the probation department, including any supplemental budget materials as provided in the reference budget documents. We have the 17-18 probation goals and accomplishments, the probation 18-19 budget, the line item detail, the supplemental, the continuing agreements list, the unified fee schedule, and the errata. Good morning, Chief. Welcome. Thank you for waiting. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Chair Friend and Board of Supervisors. Uh, I'm excited to uh, spend a short time with you today to review our fiscal year 2018-19 proposed budget. I want to share just a few of the many highlights uh, from fiscal year 18 and show examples of how we met our objectives and ambitions and plans for this upcoming year. And lastly, I'm, I will share the organizational challenges that we have uh, and the solutions that we have proposed to address them. Uh, First of all, I would like to thank and congratulate our CAO, Carlos Palacios, on a very successful first year. Um, there's a lot of new exciting advancements in our county, uh, everywhere from a new budget process to our strategic plan, so we're excited to, to be part of that. Um, I also want to thank, uh, of course, my staff for their dedication to public safety and for their passion and desire to help some of our county's most vulnerable individuals, to help them get a second chance. Um, I just uh, show this photo because it really reminds me of the supportive team that I have. This is at a rooftop fundraiser event uh, at the Community Foundation in Aptos, and I just feel fortunate to be surrounded by a great team that are very supportive of what we do. Um, and I forgot to mention, joining me today is my assistant chief, Valerie Thompson, here as well. Uh, and uh, also here are Julie Rudge, my administrative services manager, uh, Sarah Ryan, who is our juvenile hall superintendent, Rob Doty, our director of our juvenile services division, and uh, as well as Sarah Fletch, who is our adult services director. Our vision and mission, which is updated with our department's new strategic plan in 2016, nicely aligns with that of our county's new vision and mission. Furthermore, our core values and strategic priorities reflect those of the county's plan. I'm a proud member to be uh, proud to be a member of the county uh, strategic plan steering committee representing probation and public safety, and I can definitely say it's been an outstanding and engaging process, and we look forward to the implementation of that plan and helping out. Uh, being here before you always provides me with an opportunity to talk, to talk a little bit about what probation is. Uh, our layman and criminal justice system is very wide and we touch numerous systems. Um, public safety though remain through community supervision is our central role. As a criminal justice sanction, probation is a tool that holds people convicted of crimes accountable and helps them oversee their rehabilitation using evidence-based strategies the goal of prevent probation is to prevent crime and delinquency, reduce recidivism, restore victims, and promote healthy families. Uh, probation in California is distinguished by its commitment to research-based approaches to public safety. So here's what we do. We administer research-based programs, make recommendations to the court, enforce court orders, monitor compliance, and support victims of crime, and we also oversee the operations and programming our juvenile detention facility. Across the state and locally, probation has significant responsibility. There are over 350,000 adult felons on supervised probation in California. Probation is the most commonly used sanction, sanction in the criminal justice system. There are more individuals on probation in California than the combined jail, prison, and parole population. You can take this to scale and consider that on any given day locally, we might have over 450 individuals in our adult correctional facilities while we have over 1,800 individuals on adult supervision. Uh, this is a couple of my staff at a career fair. They're actually alumni from this particular school. So it, it's a great career, and since we have such a big responsibility, we do a lot of recruiting locally for future staff. The two officers here are Ed Guzman and Janelle Gilmore. So the proposed budget I'm about to review supports the important public safety work of my department. I have three public safety divisions, the juvenile hall, juvenile services, and adult services, and supporting all divisions are my administrative services staff. I won't go over all of these. I'm just going to uh, select a couple objectives on, on these slides. Uh, the probation department has always been ambitious with its goals and held itself accountable to our objectives each fiscal year. 
Since 2014, starting with our initial pilot of the new pretrial tool that is now fully implemented, we have quickly expanded and enhanced pretrial services. Our goal this past year was to work with court <coughs> stakeholders to increase concurrence rates, which we have done. Our goal is 75% concurrence rate with the recommendation. We're at 74%. Uh, importantly, we have increased uh, concurrence rates with, uh, with our recommendations for release by 21%. So the result, though, has been an uh, increase of 170% in the pretrial population from 2013 with our uh, former pretrial tool that we used to now uh, starting in 2014 using our public safety assessment. Uh, we've gone from 37 individuals a day on supervised probation to actually today we probably have about 120 on supervised uh, uh, pretrial supervision. I will share just one significant accomplishment from our juvenile division, which was transformational. Our goal in fiscal year 2017-18 was to complete the juvenile justice component of the Pew MacArthur results first cost benefit model. The juvenile model was completed and presented to you this past spring. We were the first county in California to implement a juvenile model. The model assisted us in the design of a request for proposals for juvenile probation prevention, intervention, youth and family engagement service awards. We will be returning to your board next week uh, with recommendations for which proposals to fund. These are some additional accomplishments in our juvenile division. Between 2015 and 2017, there, were, there was a 42% decline in new out-of-home placement orders. There were no new out-of-home placement orders between July 2017 and March 2018. This means that we're meeting our goal of safely maintaining youth in the community with their families. This slide illustrates our persistent and intentional work to address racial disparities. The number of Latino youth removed from their homes dropped by 33% from 2015 to 2017. After more than 20 years, uh, Santa Cruz County continues to be a leader in juvenile justice, and we were recently featured in a new Annie e. Casey Foundation publication uh, called Transforming Juvenile Probation, the Vision for Getting It Right. We're, we're proud of that. We're proud to be at the forefront of innovation in public safety and continue to be featured in these publications. In 2017, we saw the lo lowest average daily population in our juvenile hall since 2006. The decrease is attributed to an increase in diversions, alternative to detention programs, dropping arrest rates, dropping in bookings to the juvenile hall, and very strong community partnerships. We are approaching the final phases of the bid construction of our gym and hope to open construction bids this summer. So uh, as I promised about five years ago, which I thought we'd be playing basketball in a gym, hopefully next summer we'll be doing that. All right. This is a slide that really just shows our public safety success with alternatives to detention. Uh, the same can be said of our pretrial pro program, which uh, supports similar goal. For the past 16 years in the juvenile division, we've maintained a 95% successful completion rate in our juvenile hall, our juvenile detention alternative programs. I just want to show you a few uh, additional accomplishments. Our pre pre preliminary plans have been completed by the architects for the renovation of the seed to table juvenile hall renovation project, and we are ready to move to final construction drawings. So we hope to begin renovations in early 2019. Uh, eight youth also graduated from our high school uh, in the juvenile hall. This is a California pioneer slide. At, at probation, we feel that much of what we do resembles what some of the fearless pioneers did as they headed out west. I'll tell you why. Uh, our commitment first and foremost is to our community. However, we have learned that our local innovations are prime exports for jurisdictions throughout the state and the country. Our competition has always been ourselves, working hard to exceed local standards and baselines. We have not intentionally set out to be the first to do things, but sometimes it just happens that way. So for example, I'll mention the juvenile uh, results first cost benefit model, uh, which has led to a new funding model in our juvenile division. Uh, we are also one of the first jurisdictions in California to formally begin implementation of the Californians for Safety and Justice Blueprint for Shared Safety. 
Our work to implement this uh, sh blueprint for shared safety has been transformational for survivors of crime in Santa Cruz, bringing new partners to the table to look at public safety and community well-being in an innovative way. I want to thank the DA's office and victim services for, uh, and their staff for being highly active in this endeavor. Our local efforts are honing in on the needs and victims and bringing their voices to the table. And going to our budget, proposed budget for fiscal year 1819. Our proposed budget uh, is $23 million. $517,000, which is a slight increase over last year of 1.4%. The general fund contribution of slightly over $6 million is about 26% of our overall budget. Um, a good portion of that, about $3.8 million of general fund, covers the expenses to operate our juvenile hall. The proposed general fund contribution to our department includes an increase of 3.3% over last year. We've had a 25% increase uh, in our general fund contribution in the last five years, so we thank you for that. Outside of the general fund, though, uh, the majority of our budget is supported by revenues that come from state allocations and grants, grants that are time limited. In order to meet our budget target, we've had to leave two deputy probation officer positions vacant and one support staff accounting technician position vacant. These vacant positions have created hardships for my staff in meeting our public safety goals and the numerous demands of our job. We're facing challenges moving into fiscal year 2018-19 with a brunt of the impact on the adult services division. Salaries and associated costs increased by nearly a million dollars. Uh, our grant revenues have gone down and that's because they've expired. Um, we've done everything we can to look uh, for grants and there's just not that many opportunities at the moment. But this resulted in uh, nearly a $1.4 million deficit or gap that we've had to figure out how to, how to solve. So that's been our main uh, challenge. So here's our, our, our strategies to solve our budget, budget challenge and I'll talk about the impacts because each action does have a, uh, an impact. Um, and as you can see, again, our cost of doing business has gone up by uh, one million and we've had a over $400,000 decrease in revenue. But our solutions are problematic. Unfunding vac vacant positions decreases our uh, ability to appropriately supervise individuals on probation. Um, we've had to leverage some trust funds, uh, some of the growth dollars that come in annually to um, balance our budget, uh, but that means we're depleting our, you know, our trust funds and uh, we know that uh, challenging times probably lie ahead economically that's already begun. Um, and the expiration of several grants has led to several challenges for us. Seeking grant opportunities has always been a great strength of this uh, department. We will continue to do so. We just need to uh, uh, wait uh, uh, for them to come up. We're waiting patiently for that, but we're getting a little impatient. Um, and so we're also working with staff to increase revenues through targeted case management. I want to thank those staff who are currently enrolled in leveraging these important dollars. So the issues um, which don't align well with um, unfunding positions really include increased workloads. Uh, our pretrial capacity, as you've seen, it's gone up 170% since 2013. Um, we've had to redirect staff from other caseloads to, uh, to assist in, the, in this division. Um, we also, with the possibility of bail reform, which is something that I support, SB 10, um, there'll be more need in pretrial services. They'll, they'll require 24-hour, seven-day-a-week uh, assessments to be completed. So that would be a challenge for us. And of course, there's always the unfunded mandates. Uh, for instance, Prop, uh, Proposition 63, um, which is a firearm relinquishment um, um, uh, proposition that passed last year it led to a lot of uh, unexpected and unanticipated work for our department. Um, we've had an increase in the courts requesting pre-sentence investigations, uh, which is which is great because it means that we're incorporated evidence-based recommendations, but on the other hand, um, it is an increase in workload. Uh, and it, so our pretrial average daily population just, just shows you from last year, from 2016 to 2017, we've had a 61% uh, increase in our pre-sentence investigations and reports, we've had a 47% increase just from 2016 to 2017. 
In our work, uh, we must be, and lives actually too, as we must be optimistic. And despite our fiscal challenges, I really do believe our future is bright, that we got so bright that we got to wear shade. So our accomplishments this past year leave me with high hopes for the future. And this photo is of my Adult Services Division Director, Sarah Fletcher, who is here with me. Uh, but right behind her is our vision, mission, and core values that will guide our work into the future. I'd like to thank our elections clerk, Gail Pellerin, for these sunglasses. <laughs> <coughs> As stated in our proposed budget, the following are probation's objectives for fiscal year 2018-19. Based on recommendations of our results, first work, we will complete the RFP process and contract process for juvenile services. We also want to enhance our program provider portal. This will ensure timely delivery of services uh, and our ability to assess uh, outcomes for greater impact. We want to increase collaboration with youth and families. Through probation's continuum of care <coughs> reform efforts, we will increase culturally relevant services, increase trauma-informed interventions and treatment practices. Uh, we will work to staff to continue to uh, increase and leverage important federal and state dollars through tar targeted case uh, management. Um, we're also very excited about um, the possibility of uh, opening a mid-county office uh, in, in Aptos, and really this will increase accessibility for clients and victims, improve efficiency for my staff, particularly with the traffic that we all experience on a daily basis, and decrease their time spent in traffic and increase their ability to spend more time with clients and victims. Last but not least in our budget objectives is our probation resource center. Probation is developing. There, um, let me get that slide. Probation is developing this resource center to uh, facilitate behavioral change for our clients and ex expand community-based alternatives to incarceration for a supervised probation population. Uh, we want to locate our main, co-locate our main service providers throughout the week to provide these supportive services. And really, what we want to do is a rapid handoff of services. Once they come to the probation department, we want to engage them right away um, and with the, our current partners that we're currently working with. I started with a photo of our probation team, and I want to close with this presentation with another one of our great team. This photo should make our county proud. It was taken last week in Virginia. After learning a little bit about our local work, the state of Virginia invited probation. They paid all expenses, and our partners at Encompass to facilitate a day and a half training on youth and family engagement. Um, in this photo there is uh, Valerie Thompson. I recruited Valerie about five years ago from Virginia, so I think we owed them a little something. <laughs> and she decided to come back after this trip. I was a little worried about that. <laughs> I'd like to at now ask your board's approval for our recommended budget, which is approve the proposed budget for the probation department, including any supplemental materials as recommended by the county administrative officer. Um, Referencing on these pages, proposed budgets, pages 291 to 303. Line item detail, pages 521 to 524, and our continuum agreement um, pages, which are not listed, but we'll, we'll, figure, that, we'll figure that out. Um, this concludes my presentation, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Chief. We'll start with uh, Supervisor Caput. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, good to see you here. And, nice uh, to see you, too. Uh, with uh, with your probation, uh, what percent, it's a much higher adult uh, probation than juvenile probation, but uh, what percent uh, percentages do you have? Um, well, I can tell you that our caseload side, our total cases that we supervise in adult probation are, is a little bit over uh, 1,800 individuals to receive some level of supervision. There's different uh, um, risk assigned to each case. In our juvenile uh, probation, we have about 170 active probationers, so the scale is much different. So we have uh, far more uh, staff assigned to our adult division. Sure. Um, in our juvenile division, we have 14 probation officers. Yeah, and then once uh, somebody's on probation, I'm just curious, uh, uh, a lot of them are probably not you know, committing any other crimes, and they're doing very well and actually progressive. Uh, progressing very well, but they, their one thing they're not good at is showing up or calling in uh, when they're supposed to be on probation. You're supposed to meet with them. They don't show up. Uh, they don't make a phone call, but, but you know they're doing well. 
Uh, what percentage is that? Because that's probably. I, yeah, I could know. I could tell you just based on our recent um, evaluation of AB 109, which is which is really 10 percent of our overall adult probation population. But to give you an idea, um, with uh, of the whole um, population on AB 109, 32 percent uh, had recidivated, so meant reoffended. Um, the majority of those reoffenses being misdemeanor charges, um, which include property and crimes and substance use disorder sure. types of crimes. So um, while, as you stated, many of them, most of them do well, you know, uh, three quarters of them do well, we, do, we still have challenges. Uh, some are recidivating and reoffending re uh, at lower levels, but nonetheless reoffending. And we address that really through different and appropriate treatment uh, interventions to address their, their needs. Their needs. Uh, as our sheriff talked about, really are uh, uh, related to substance use disorder, mental health needs. So it's a challenge. We all share the same challenges. I, I guess more specifically, uh, it would be uh, uh, how many are actually the only crime they're committing is not showing up for probation uh, appointments or well, we, keeping in contact. Yeah, we do and a lot of work with technology of to be able to to uh, check in with them one. Um, so if, if you don't show up for your probation appointment, we're not issuing a bench warrant for their arrest automatically. Right. Uh, we have actually have a program that does some outreach and they'll go out, a community-based provider will seek them out and say, hey, you know, you should, you should probably check in with your probation officer or, or remind them about court dates so they don't actually do that. Um, uh, and one of the reasons we want to open up probation resource centers so they can do their check-ins right there together. Um, we're looking into the idea of a, of a kiosk where folks can just come in and enter some information in a computer uh, that, you know, for their check-in. Um, so, w you know, we don't arrest folks when they don't show up for an appointment. It's like a, we want to really incorporate technology like the dentist or your doctor's office uses, uh, you know, text messages and so on, things like that. Um, however, if they're P persistent and we can't find them, we make all efforts, there usually is a, a warrant that will go out, but that doesn't happen that frequently. As, I don't know if that answers your question. And what about, uh, I wonder how the military, uh, years ago, uh, quite a while ago, uh, the military was like an option for some, you know, they would go and, but then the military got ve very uh, uh, strict on, you know, back background and all that. Uh, how does that work out today? If, uh, so well, that's, that's why it's important to work on um, folks uh, sealing the records, having their certain felony cases reduced to misdemeanors, like Prop 47, for instance, help the eligibility in those cases. Um, and so, and there's possibilities of uh, sunsetting uh, le legislation that would actually sunset certain crimes or convictions, or wipe them off people's uh, records that would help them. But if you have a felony, record, it's, there's many, many barriers, and that would include going to the military, let alone jobs, housing, education, and so on. So it's still, it's still a barrier having a criminal record. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done in that area. And then uh, uh, how secure is somebody uh, uh, with their uh, juvenile probation, or their juvenile record? Uh, they committed crimes, and then when they become an adult, I guess in some, in some cases, the uh, the the juvenile crime is sealed. Yeah, that's that's. There's been uh, quite a few bills, uh, uh, several of them sponsored by uh, Mark Stone uh, in Sacramento that are, are sealing of, re of juvenile records. So there's automatic sealing in a lot of cases, which wasn't the case before, which really helps uh, youth not it have to. Get going yeah, that the doesn't stall their future progress and their ability to get into school and jobs. People are understanding that those are barriers. So there's been some good progress in the state here. Yeah, uh, because like I've said before, sometimes you know, growing up, uh, the difference between one being on probation and having a record, uh, and the other is how fast can you run. Uh, yeah, and you know, I mean, it just yeah. It's we don't want to judge our juveniles or adults just by the the mistake they made, they made and carry that for the rest of their lives. That's our our goal is transformation and and second third opportunities in may, many cases. You bet. And you know, keep up the good work. Uh, really uh, proud uh, uh, of how you're doing it because we're a part of it, and. Uh, uh, it makes me feel good that we're doing a great job. And, and your predecessor, where is he now? Uh, 
uh, lost track of him. Scott McDonald, the, yeah. you were talking about former chief. He, well, he's, he's still very busy. Uh, he's actually doing a lot of work uh, throughout the state and uh, similar issues, uh, jail utilization studies, um, detention reform studies. So he's, he's busy. Well, wow. okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, uh, c congratulations through the years uh, you, of your foresight and getting grants. I mean, if there was one out there, our probation department was gonna get it, it seemed. They've had a great chance of doing that, but the unfortunate thing is it doesn't seem like there's that many available comparatively, and uh, is that a, a general statement? That yes, yes, I, you know, um, I, this is my, um, I'm going to my fifth year as chief, and uh, in the first year, well, the economy, you know, was uh, coming out of the, the whole, the recession, and the state uh, was putting out, uh, Board of State and Community Corrections, a number of opportunities. Our Myoka grant, for instance, our juvenile hall renovation grant, that was nine and a half million dollars. Our, um, uh, some federal dollars uh, that helped us leverage a number of programs on the juvenile side. I think there was 14 million dollars in grants that we actually received, we were yeah. eight for 10. Um, and that, those opportunities have not popped up or merged uh, in the last three years. Basically, we haven't seen, and you bet we'll jump on it when they come out, but uh, we're still looking, you know, at federal, any opportunity we can, but uh, it's uh, because I think the economy's, you know, slowed down a bit, those opportunities have decreased, but hopefully it'll come back. Yeah, well, and that being said, I, I wanted to congratulate you on uh, the partnerships uh, as we discussed with the Sheriff's Department too. This is gonna have to be a cooperative, um, effort to address our the issues of the day um, in this with health, health and human services in particular on their day reporting center <clears throat> that that starts the first or uh, July 1st the first of this fiscal year it, it uh, they'll we won't probably have the program going until uh, this fall there's some uh, at first uh, upfront and renovation that we need to do um, we're securing I'm keeping my fingers crossed, but uh, there'll be some, you know, contracts that go before your board sometime in August to uh, uh, lease space below our office just right across the street. Um, but it's gonna take a little bit of renovation up front, technology, some doors change, you know, walls moved around and so on. And, um, so we hope to have folks actually starting and coming in and receiving services by, by September. Yeah, so, I, I just want to congratulate yeah. you on this collaborative effort. Um, it's just efficient and it's better for the client as well. So uh, thank you. And troublesome about the supervision that you've had, uh, and it showed um, on your report on page five, the 47% increase from 2016 and 17. Is that trajectory, is that, are we still on the same track of that? Um, it goes from 62 to 100 from 2016 to 2017. Oh, that was pre, yeah, pre-trial supervision. Yeah. Yes, that's, I mean, of course, is uh, I'm working with our sheriff to really uh, reduce unnecessary detention, incarceration, pre-trial is very important, but uh, there is an increased burden um, on us uh, as we run pre-trial to supervise all those individuals, uh, you know, appropriately. So it's a huge jump and of course, um, as I mentioned, uh, we, We've, we pulled staff even from our juvenile division to help out, to help manage the uh, folks on supervised. So it, it, it is an issue. Uh, and if bail reform, which is SB 10, were, were to pass, uh, we would even have uh, uh, higher numbers. Yeah. Well, um, in general, overall, I, I think we have a good county budget here and we're in control, much better control than some of the other counties throughout the state. But I think it's evident too from your report uh, that the additional needs to address new problems, different problems from what we were looking at five years ago on the sheriff's side, human health services side, your side, um, there's clearly some identified needs that in the near future, if we are going to address this in a collaborative effort and reach the people that, you, that we need to reach, um, it's gonna take additional funding and so forth. So, as, as uh, favorable as it looks right now with the recovering economy that's been taking place for several years, um, we, we're gonna require more efforts and what you're doing, and, um, but that's not to say you're not doing what, enough of what you have. I just wanna say thank you for that, but uh, we need to uh, be aware that there's gonna be a more clearly some uh, identified needs that we need to address in the, in the near future. So yeah, thank I, you for your cooperative efforts. Yeah, too. and I, I assure you our, our uh, agencies, our health and human services, health services, our sheriff, 
all our agencies are working together and we really embrace the partnerships and, and get a lot done. I think that's what makes uh, Santa Cruz County unique uh, because collectively we, we, we definitely get together and, and, and ha re have results. So okay, thank you. we'll do that. Thank you, Supervisor Coonerty. Sure. First of all, thank you for your work and your commitment to being a national leader uh, in you know, outcomes and using data to make the best decisions uh, for the people in the system and our community. I am concerned about your caseloads uh, because you're a linchpin in our criminal justice system. Uh, if if we, we can have all the programs in the world, uh, but if we assume that people are being uh, having oversight and being able to, to sort of uh, be directed in those ways, uh, that's one thing. If essentially they're released and having no oversight, uh, and uh, that's a real problem. I don't want to uh, make any decisions, but I think you know part of the direction should be that we get a report back in a month from you and the CAO about what, whether we're how we're able to reduce caseloads uh, and what those impacts will look like. Because if you look at the numbers. Um, and you look at the trends with the grants and with new responsibilities, it doesn't seem like it's getting any better. It's going to get any better. Uh, so, uh, and right now we're in a when what a, a concerning situation. So, um, I think, I think, I think we have to keep a c close eye on it, and we have to work and and may have to allocate more mm -hmm. resources. But I'll let you and the CAO talk yeah. and see what see what see what our options are. Thank you for acknowledging that. Yeah, as it, I would hope to show a story of the trends are going in different directions. Yeah. Um, so, um, and that really, our our staff, uh, you know, to their uh, it's against their kind of in, their integrity in many ways to know what they could do if they had you know manageable caseloads. It, I want to assure uh, folks that our domestic violence caseloads, our realignment caseloads, specialized caseloads like sex offender caseloads, special most team and the mental health caseloads are being supervised appropriately. But there's a lot of other cases that still are at uh, moderate risk to recidivate, even lower risk that that um, need more supervision, and and that would prevent those cases actually from moving deeper into the system. Absolutely. Thank you, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, uh, I think that uh, as we continually move uh, to supporting efforts based on data and using evidence-based practices, um, the probation department has been far, far ahead of everyone else in this area. And uh, this has been a core part of what probation has done for years. Uh, while others are, are trying to catch up with, uh, with it. So I just want to recognize your leadership and the leadership of your staff um, in, in terms of um, showing that uh, if, we, if we look at good data and we design good programs and we can uh, measure success, uh, that we can see real change happen. Uh, as I look at your, um, uh, the, the narrative in the budget this year, um, I think we've been a leader on juvenile uh, uh, justice uh, reform for a long time, but to then see a 14 percent decrease in the, AD, in the average daily attendance at juvenile hall, um, it's, it, it's sometimes you wonder how much uh, you can wring out of, the, out, of that, uh, out of that rock. Yeah. And so to see that kind of uh, decrease and to see the no new out-of-home placements in, in 2017. Um, you know, what do you, what do you credit that with? Uh, I mean, it's pretty uh, impressive. Yeah, uh, thank you for that, that acknowledgement. And so it's really uh, the, the, the team that we have, but there's a couple of things. We, we really worked hard to e increase diversions um, in the last couple of years. So, so diverting, so means, you know, a lot of cases come to our, our attention and many of them are diversion eligible. So we actually increased uh, we in our diversions by 42 percent. So that really decreased the number of folks that were even going to come into the juvenile justice system and be formally adjudicated. That helped obviously decrease the juvenile hall population because they won't even have an opportunity. But there's a declining uh, arrest rate in cr uh, juvenile justice uh, um, crime rate uh, in the state and locally. You know, we, we know we've had some obviously uh, violent cases and that, that, that persists, but we can't let that distract us from the overall trends that continue to show a decline. I, I would also attribute that our, our work to decrease population really to 
really extra special efforts on youth and family engagement through a, um, a wraparound program, our Fuerte model, which is a partnership with Encompass. It's really working with families who are struggling with children who have mental health issues uh, and really and, and a culturally responsive, trauma-informed way. That, I, that's made a significant difference, I think, uh, and, and keeping youth May, normally might have been in our juvenile hall, they are out of detention. Having fewer kids sent to group homes actually means that they're not sitting in juvenile hall waiting to go to placements or in placements and they often run away, then they come back. So that's the other, uh, the impact. And uh, uh, you had a second point. Uh, uh, well, no, it's the, just, it just the decrease in uh, average daily population at juvenile hall and the out-of-home placements. Uh, so. Uh, you covered them both there. Okay. You, you know, uh, it was interesting, uh, uh, Sarah Fletcher participates in the Justice and Gender Task Force, which I'm very appreciative, and she's an active participant uh, that offers a lot there. And, you know, we heard from uh, women in the, the criminal justice system, and one of the things that, uh, uh, that several women talked about is a relationship that there was work done with families as well as the person, um, in this case, the woman who uh, uh, was in the criminal justice system, and there was a program whose name I forget. Uh, what was it? New, new directions, directions. The program that. And uh, so we were all very interested, and the new direction isn't going away. And then Sarah said, "Well, let me do the research," and found that a lot of those, a lot of those pieces had been incorporated in the ongoing work of the probation department. So you took that that grant funded um, opportunity and found a way to, uh, to include that in the regular w work of the department. Uh, and I think that the, the benefits are great because we know that um, support from family uh, can make a huge difference in, in uh, changing the arc of someone's experience um, at the criminal justice system. So I appreciated that. I appreciate her participation in that. Um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm also very interested in this probation resource center. Um, uh, uh, I feel fortunate that I got a longer presentation of it was serving as on the Criminal Justice Council. You, uh, we've talked about it. I think this is a good move for Santa Cruz. In some ways, it's surprising that it's going to taken us so long to get one of these. Um, uh, but I think it's a success of other parts of the system. And now as we yeah. continue to, to try to be um, to even be better at it, um, that this resource will be very, very helpful. And I'm wondering if you, you, do you have any data that shows that a resource like this can actually reduce recidivism? Uh, there, there is some, some data. I mean, uh, re day reporting centers, uh, um, probation resources, they're a little bit different. Um, uh, many counties have day reporting centers, which are um, 44 counties, in fact, do, which are, you know, court uh, mandated. Um, and there's sanctions if you don't show up. Uh, our, our vision is to really do a supportive center where folks come to our probation that doesn't matter if they're AB 109 or general supervision that they can get services right away. So um, nonetheless, it's a recent innovation with realignment. A lot of counties just went online and started opening up these programs. Now there's a couple studies now. Uh, one is Kern County. Um, that had a very uh, high success rate with reducing recidivism. They did a thorough evaluation. Um, a couple other counties are, um, are now, I reached out to looking for evaluations and uh, Riverside County hopes to do one in the upcoming fiscal year. Uh, Sonoma County recently did one that touched a little bit on the evaluation, so it's showing a lot of promise. But I think since it's been five, about five, well, it's been more than five years since realignment, seven, seven years uh, uh, or so, Folks are just, they implemented the programs, now they're thinking about the evaluation. But, um, but there is evidence, if you looked outside of California, and, uh, and there's a, a federal probation, and some states have operated day reporting centers um, where there's research too that supports not just reduction in the, the recidivism, which is a great indicator, but increased employment, reduction in substance use disorder, uh, family, housing, and so on, that they got those needs. So uh, uh, I, I know, you know with our um, realignment evaluation that we did, we have a baseline, and when we imp now when we implement our uh, reporting center, we'll actually be able to measure what the impact was. Actually, we could, hopefully we show a, a trend line in a couple of years saying that even a reporting center started and, and recidivism dropped even further. Well, I think that, that the work that, that you've done with Results First, which has shown us what the cost is of recidivism, 
um, from the adult population, no, 42, I think it was 42,000, mm -hmm. and for the juvenile population, it was over $100,000. So this is, uh, if, if, if this can be helpful in helping us reduce that recidivism rate, um, uh, it will pay for itself handsomely on the back end. Uh, I share the concern of my colleague uh, about um, workload. Uh, you know, I'm happy to hear about the concurrence rate from the judiciary. I know that's something that, that's been an issue of concern. Uh, and, I, and I'm really happy to see the number of people on pretrial uh, release and I think that's shown itself over the many years that we've had it to be a successful program. And I agree with you that bail reform will have an impact, um, uh, not only the people in the system, but obviously on the staff who is gonna be responsible for overseeing um, the people who would, may currently be in jail now, but um, in the future may be out of jail. And I think we're gonna be, we are challenged. I'm glad to see that we have increased the general fund contribution to probation uh, department by 25% over five years, but it's paltry uh, compared to, uh, to the size of the budget and um, to what we're actually asking you to do. Uh, we're asking you to, um, to be one of the lines of safety uh, in the community for people that we determined don't need to be incarcerated but need to be supervised. And I'm glad to hear that, that uh, domestic violence cases, sexual offender cases, et cetera, are, are, are do you, f are you feel are well managed. But I think that um, if, as we think about public safety, we have to ensure that we have an adequate number of probation officers to take on the responsibility that we're actually asking you to uh, uh, take care of because I think it works against us long term. You know, the sheriff just sat in that chair just a few minutes ago talking about alternatives to incarceration. You are the alternative to incarceration. So if we want to keep them out of jail and we want to keep the community safe, we have to depend on you and your staff and we have to provide the resources. So I look forward to, the, uh, I would support the action of my colleague uh, to, to have a report back on that and, and get some sense about how we can do that um, adequately. <coughs> thank you for the work and thank you for the work of everyone on the staff. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, while we're adding line items on, can we add a line item on for new sunglasses for Sarah Fletcher, I think? Yeah. Um, she could have my park sunglasses that we got yesterday. <laughs> we'll just, we'll, we'll open it up to the community as a very thorough presentation. Is there anybody from the community who'd like to address this specifically on the probation budget? Okay, we'll see none. We'll bring it back to the board. Supervisor Coonerty? Yeah, so uh, I'll move the recommended action with additional direction that uh, the probation officer and the sales office return to us with uh, staffing options in uh, August. The, yeah, the first meeting in August. If we Second. could, okay, if I could just modify, we have a, a packed meeting that first meeting in August, so we could maybe have it just come back in August and then the determination yeah. be by the CAO of what meeting? That okay. comfortable with okay. that. Okay, any other conversation? All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for your work. We'd like to bring up the district attorney for our final budget item of the day, which is to consider the 2018-19 proposed budgets for the district attorney and public administrator, including all supplemental budget materials as provided in the reference budget documents. We have the district attorney proposed budget, line item details, supplemental and continuing agreements list. We'd like to thank Mr. Rizal for your patience and understanding and the rearranging of the schedule this morning. Good morning and welcome. Good morning and thank you, uh, Chairman and board members for the opportunity to be here. We appreciate this. Uh, I want to start by acknowledging um, all of the board members and the chairman for the help and support that you have been to the DA's office over the last several years. I want to acknowledge the CAO's office who has been instrumental in partnering with us on numerous projects and trying to uh, figure out creative ways for us to accomplish uh, the goals that we need and also uh, county council who has been instrumental as well in dealing with uh, several issues that we came uh, we come up with and we've encountered over the last several years. I wanna start off uh, talking a little bit about uh, the responsibilities, not only of, it, it lists local government, uh, the California Constitution, that public safety is the first responsibility of local government officials. Uh, I bring this up for several reasons, uh, one of which is, it's, uh, it, it, you guys are uh, public officials, then public safety is the number one mandated um, 
sort of responsibility. I bring it up also to, to let the public know, but I also bring it up for us. As a DA's office, when we see something like this, it, it uh, reinforces how important the duties that we, we do are to the public. And so I have started with that slide. I think it's an important slide to remind not just all of us in this room, uh, but the public and, and even those in my office and myself about um, our responsibilities. The DA's office's responsibilities come from a numerous sources, the California Constitution, the United States Constitution, various statutes, and the rules of professional conduct. We as DAs are really the only lawyers in the entire system that take an oath of justice, not to zealously represent, but an oath of justice, an oath to make sure that justice is done and justice is served. Um, as the DA's office, it is our duty to support the rights of victims, to support the rights of defendants as well, to investigate, to review and file cases, as well as mandate to act ethically, uh, as I've said, the uh, duty to seek justice. The DA's office mission statement, which was accomplished under my predecessor Bob Lee's uh, leadership is to promote and ensure public safety through ethical and just prosecution. And I want to thank the staff of the DA's office uh, as well, because each and every day all of us live this mission statement and do all that we can to try to provide safety and justice for this community. The DA's office is the referring agency from every single law enforcement agency in this county. Uh, all the police departments, the county sheriff, uh, as well as numerous other sort of sources from the highway patrol to UCSC police department. So when we try to get an understanding of who we are and what we do, it's important, I think, for all of us to, to recognize and understand that the cases that we get, that we are mandated to investigate, to review, and to file when appropriate, come from all of these sources. Want to briefly touch on some of the accomplishments that have taken place. And these accomplishments, really, I have come to you every time with a budget proposal and asked you for your support for various sort of things. One of them last year that we focused on that this board has been incredibly supportive as well as the CAO's office, is in setting up a multidisciplinary interview center. This is a center that is a sort of a neutral environment where children can come to be interviewed, that partnerships exist between the law enforcement agency, social service agencies, and forensic interviews can be conducted in a safe, child-friendly environment uh, so that uh, repeated interviews are not uh, required and don't need to take place. And I'm pleased to report that this center, with your support and the cooperation of all the law enforcement partners in this county, as well as uh, the health partners, Child Protective Services and others, opened officially in November of 2017. It is up and running, and the center is an amazingly valuable asset to the entire community, uh, specifically the children of this community, but also to every other sort of family member that has been touched, uh, unfortunately, um, by victimization of children. The Santa Cruz County Anti-Crime Team, uh, this is something that we resumed the leadership role of in 2017, and I'm pleased to report that in terms of effectiveness of combating crime on the streets uh, with focuses in all sorts of areas, specifically Watsonville and Santa Cruz are requiring a lot of attention, that they are out on the streets um, many days during the weekend, 53 firearms seized, 207 parole probation searches conducted, 402 field interviews and 1,300 grams of various narcotics seized. This is a team that is dedicated to frontline enforcement, um, seizing weapons, intervening on the street. It's also a team that in the future has started to not only take kind of a front end or back end approach, but also sort of try to look at a front end approach, an educational approach, because what are the people that are part of the crime team have found is that at a younger and younger age, people are starting to become involved. So they have seen a real need to target 
younger people than junior high and even uh, elementary school levels in certain instances to try to do some educational outreach. So many of you have been at meetings um, where the crime team has come in and tried to tell you and explain to you what they're seeing and they're trying to partner up with local sort of educational uh, um, entities so that they can make their way into the schools and try to use the information that they've gained on the street on a front end approach as well as sort of a back end approach. The other thing that you have been very supportive of and we're asking for some more support uh, on is the body worn camera sort of uh, information that we're getting. The law enforcement agencies in this count, county, some have already transitioned to body-worn cameras, some are in the process of transitioning, some have uh, cameras in their vehicles, and it has been, it, it's a good thing, as you heard Sheriff Hart talk about, but it comes with uh, intense sort of requirements as DAs filing cases, using these in court to try to review uh, <coughs> this sort of information and make it in toward some sort of intelligible, presentable uh, fashion for, for court. The other thing that we are working on is uh, every case now, and I've described this in the past, that in the past cases were this thick with the advent of cell phones, computers, uh, social media, the the cases have just grown in terms of complexity. They've grown in terms of information, not only that you need to review, but information that you need to try to synthesize and present in a logical fashion in court. And it is it, it is quite the the task. Up to now, we have used a lot of sworn personnel, investigators in our office, to do this information processing and what we're trying to get is a position and it's in our budget for somebody who is not a sworn personnel that will cost less money to try to engage in some of this sort of activity for us. Consumer and environmental protection, this is one of the areas that I came to you uh, in the very beginning and asked you if you would help support the DA's office in beefing up this uh, this area so that we can outreach to the community. And I'm pleased to tell you that last year alone, we got $3.4 million uh, for consumer protection enforcement. This money is limited. It needs to go back into consumer protection. But I want to explain to the board that the money that you have given us and the support that you have given us, we as a DA's office have utilized and we have done not only exactly what we said, but we've done more than we said we would. I think when I started in 2014, we had reserves of $240,000 and now we're looking at excess of 500 or 5 million. So this consumer protection unit that we have, uh, we've doubled this, more than doubled the size of it, is out there working diligently in the community to protect our citizens. Environmental uh, protection, we have done a lot of that. You can see that some of it is penalties. There's been a lot of abatement that's taken place. But this unit of the DA's office, which in the old days we didn't really hear very much about, has really um, sort of blossomed under the assistance that the board has given the district attorney's office, and it's important to our entire community. The victim witness assistance program uh, is another sort of area that we needed some critical staffing, which has taken place. We were able to get some grant funding for that. We are instituting what's known as a therapy dog program, and what they found is that across the, the state and the country for that matter, that the presence of a dog in court with children or others who have anxiety is something that um, has been very effective in reducing trauma and anxiety while testifying in court or talking about things that are incredibly difficult. So uh, the staff in victim witness processes an unbelievable amount of compensation claims as, as you can see from the numbers that are posted there um, and have really been instrumental in getting $1.4 million of state funding to families that have been victimized that need it. So uh, finally, and I've tried to keep this brief, I apologize if I've spoken fast, but I uh, wanted to keep it brief uh, for you. The Budget numbers, you can see that our total revenues of 6.3 million are there. 18.1 um, is the 
budget. We're at 101 FTEs. There's been an 8.5% increase in expenditures, and the vast majority of that are salaries and benefits. And when I've come to you in the past, um, I had really not asked for very much in the last couple of budget cycles, and the reason was I was very interested in retaining both investigators and retaining uh, prosecutors, district attorneys. Because what we have seen is a lot of those people, it was so much easier to make more money over the hill that we had a lot of experience. We would train people and they would leave and go elsewhere. And I'm pleased to report that that is not taking place in the DA's office. So we are essentially asking for one IT support. We had an IT support position, we're unfunding it. And we're asking for an addition of a criminalist position to sort of process the phones that we do, the computers, so that we can present that evidence, actually sort through it, and then present that evidence in court. There's been some new rules in the last several years with regard to search warrants and other things that have really put sort of a labor-intensive burden on investigators. And so that is the presentation that I have for you. I want to thank all of you. I'm happy to answer any questions. And uh, I just want to once again thank you for the support that you've shown us in the past and let you and the public know that the money has been well spent. So. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor McPherson. <coughs> thank you. And I, I, um, I'm really glad to see some of the results um, that have taken place in the consumer affairs. Um, victim assistance and so forth, um, very much needed and appreciated, I know, by those involved. Um, it seems like the, with the cannabis ordinance and so forth, environmental uh, concerns are, um, are, are going to be a, a, an increased, it's going to get growing attention from your office. Is that generally correct, it, or how it, do you see this it, coming I, down? I do, and it, and it is. What we've seen thus far is with illegal grows, uh, a lot of them, the environment is severely impacted. It's impacted by various herbicides or odenticides, you know, various forms of pollution that are seeping in not only to, to the land but into the water table and the streams uh, that, that we all rely on. We've also seen clear cutting, deforestation, and other things that have taken place over the years. And when I speak to colleagues up in Humboldt and areas that have intensive sort of grow scenarios, the message that we keep getting is in terms of prosecuting cases and looking at cases, the environmental sort of aspect of these is a very important um, angle that we need to make sure we pay attention to. We need to take water samples. We need to take samples of uh, pollution that's in the ground and various environmental factors. So what I think is necessary to really sort of do these cases justice and to have uh, issues that resonate with the public is to make sure that on the investigative side we are doing all of those environmental sort of uh, investigative techniques that, that we should be doing so that when we present a case we can explain to the public and to juries uh, what the impact really is. Speaking to neighbors, because I know that you people have seen a lot of people uh, come forth that are in adjacent or neighboring spots to grows that have a lot of complaints. Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure that the environmental sort of aspect of this is thoroughly investigated and um, explored. Uh, and you mentioned and to be commended for the anti-crime team and so forth. Uh, you're looking at more at um, addressing uh, students in the elementary, junior high level. Is this uh, primarily, I, I would assume, gang related? Is that, uh, yeah, the focus of the anti-crime team is very is gang related. It's basically to, to go out and to uh, engage directly with the community, at-risk community, or, or people who are involved in gang behavior. And so when we talk about weapons that have been taken off the street and other things, those are weapons that are really coming out of the hands <coughs> of gang members. And in our experience, <coughs> gang members who are ready to use those weapons. Since the institution of this team, you really can track the drop in homicide rates that we have experienced in this county. So the, the anti-crime team is a very integral, important part <coughs> of uh, keeping the lid on on gang violence. And as you can say, and if you go back to the slide, from the DA's office perspective, the jurisdictions don't necessarily matter whether a case takes place in Santa Cruz or Watsonville or the sheriff's jurisdiction because it all comes to us anyway. 
And I can tell you in terms of just even budgetary, when a homicide happens, the amount of resources, not to mention the human tragedy, which is absolutely obvious, but the amount of resources that are expended to try to investigate that, the overtime and all of the, the uh, money that is funneled into that, as it should be, is something that when we invest on the front end and something like the, the gang team is all saved and, and, and um, kind of not spent. Yeah. Well, I, th I think uh, you're to be given credit. I'm glad that we have been able to support that, that effort with you. It is, it's been, um, been said that with the sheriff, the probation department, when you're proactive, it's pretty hard to just really establish how much you've saved, but um, right. Uh, if you saved one life or certainly a lot of money, uh, it's well worth it. And I know uh, it's been a real team effort and a real focus on our entire uh, public safety team who have worked with, uh, has, been, has been mentioned, human services, health services agencies to uh, really help us address this problem before it becomes a problem. So thank you very much for your efforts. Thank you, Supervisor. Supervisor Caput. Uh, I just want to tell you, I think you're doing a great job, and I really appreciate all the work that you're doing, uh, your department, when I say you. And uh, they're a reflection of your leadership. And so, uh, and you had a tough uh, transition uh, following in some big uh, footsteps, uh, uh, you know. Yes, thank you. You I, bet. I appreciate those comments, and thank you. Doing, doing, we, we, as a team, and I will say that, we really are a team in the DA's office. <coughs> <coughs> are doing the best we can with the resources we have, but it is a group of dedicated people to our mission statement to public safety. So it's the core of what, frankly, drives all of us in that office. You bet. And I appreciate uh, the work uh, consumer uh, affairs uh, being supervisors. We normally will deal with them in a lot of cases. It could be a problem with, uh, um, uh, what would you call it? Uh, a nursing home, or it could be a problem, you know, with uh, <coughs> uh, uh, rental problems in uh, senior communities right. and all that. And <coughs> you've been a great help, so I, I appreciate everything. We appreciate that. We're happy also to do outreach, you know, preventative sort of um, outreach, which we've done, I know, with some of you. And it's a big part of what we are, we are about in the Consumer Protection Unit. Okay. And something I probably have asked you before, like with uh, cold cases, um, there I know there's one in the Watsonville area. I can't remember all the names, but uh, I know the family that was uh, a victim of that uh, years ago. I, I guess that's improving, but at the same time, uh, those are very difficult cases because the witnesses and um, being able to talk to people uh, over years gets more and more difficult. It, it is. Forensically, sort of with DNA or other analysis, some of those cases we've gotten real breaks on. In fact, we had one last year with somebody who committed, uns they were unsolved homicides. This person's already spending the rest of his life in prison. But we were able to get information. He came back uh, and ended up pleading guilty to a life sentence for a crime and there was some closure for the families. So. When it comes to cold cases, I can say this on behalf of the DA's office and the police agencies, we don't forget. And if people have information about those things, we are always willing to listen and reconsider. Um, and you're, you're right, Supervisor, sometimes time makes things much more difficult, but sometimes times can help if people don't have the same motivations to be quiet or, or whatever else. But we don't forget, um, and neither do the other police agencies in this county. You bet. Thank you. You bet. Thank you. And uh, when we're done, I'll, uh, and we have public comment, <laughs> I'll move for approval. Thank you. Supervisor Coonerty? Yeah. I just want to thank you for your work on the, both the civil and the criminal side. It's truly professional, um, responsive to the needs of this community. I think it was highlighted earlier by the sheriff. We have a, we have a problem with folks who are sort of the chronic reoffenders. We've talked about this. We've worked on it. Um, if we're able to identify the resources to have the sheriff's office work countywide, you know, we want to work with you and the PAC court and the new judge uh, there to make sure that we are uh, bringing the criminal justice side to, to to, the, to bear 
uh, to deal with these folks who are the most challenging. Challenging. We're, we are there and ready to do that, and thank you for your support. Supervisor Leopold. Um, thank you for the presentation, Mr. Rosell. I really appreciate the work that you're doing as our district attorney, and uh, I was grateful to see uh, that uh, you uh, got 98% uh, of the vote uh, in, in, in the recent election. Uh, it was nice to see no one ran against you. Too. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, I I want to uh, express my appreciation. I'm glad that. Um, we were able uh, to provide uh, more resources um, and that you chose to put it in consumer protection and environmental protection. I think those are core values uh, of this board, of the community, of your office. Um, and with the increase this year of adding uh, an additional uh, district attorney or assistant district attorney with the cannabis, I think it just strengthens that and uh, your commitment to looking at uh, environmental impacts and as a way of um, uh, addressing this uh, this field that that uh, didn't exist just a few years right. ago uh, is is very useful. I also want to express my appreciation uh, to Rob Wade in your office, who's bar been participating in the Justice and Gender yes. uh, Task Force. He's been a really um, a great participant, uh, offering a lot of good information, providing information to people uh, on the task force. Um, and it's clear that he has a, a similar commitment uh, to ensuring that our, our, our system is, uh, meets the needs of women and understands that there are different needs of women. Uh, so I, I, I know that comes f from you, um, and he's your representative, but uh, I just appreciate his work uh, in doing this. And um, on the anti-crime team, um, this is a joint effort with the other uh, police departments. Um, and do they all contribute towards the uh, uh, the anti-crime team? So the answer is the sheriff has their own program at this point, but with respect to, yeah, I should have touched on this, with respect to the other law enforcement agencies in this county, the answer is yes. Highway Patrol has a, a person in there, Watsonville has a person in there, Santa Cruz City has a person in there. Um, the other agencies, Capitola and Scotts Valley, have provided up till now you know, m monetary contributions. Um, Capitola does take the lead in terms of the uh, chief being the one to, to oversee the direct supervision of those folks. But I'm actually pleased to announce in terms of support that Capitola, Scotts Valley, UCSC, as well as um, uh, Santa Cruz PD have all made a commitment to put a person in there for three months at a stretch. So what it's going to do is provide right now an extra body that, and which is important when you're on sure. the street for safety reasons and a whole host of others, uh, it's really important. You need people out there. So they have made that commitment, which we are all very pleased with. Watsonville and Santa Cruz have had some challenges in terms of their budgets and devoting another person to this unit, but it is uh, on their list of things to do is to actually provide more support. Um, and I'm pleased to report that the Highway Patrol has left somebody in. They're also working, there's a probation officer that they work with as well. So it's a real cooperative sort of group effort that focuses on South County and North County. Um, and it's working amazingly well. Sure. Uh, lastly, I appreciate the commitment that you've made to the Criminal Justice Council um, and, uh, and all the different things that go on within the CJC. Uh, and your interest in wanting to co-sponsoring event around restorative justice that's going to take place in the fall. Um, I think that's a, a, a that's that's one of the many issues we need to talk about within the criminal justice system. And I'm glad that you were willing to step forward and be part of that conversation. We absolutely are. So thank you for your work. Thank you for the work of your office. And I know you have a lot of hardworking ADAs down we there. Do. Um, uh, and uh, I just want you to know we all appreciate the time and energy they put in to the cases that they have. Uh, to protect the people in Santa Cruz County. Thank you very much, Supervisor. I'll just add my thanks. Uh, recognize there isn't a huge crowd here to speak to uh, your issues. We'll consider that a reflection of, by the way, not all the votes went counted, Supervisor Leopold, so you should be a little careful <laughs> before we certify that on the 98% number. 
Same for you, Ms. Driscoll. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but with that said, uh, you and I have had a conversation about something I know you take very seriously, which is um, you have a very unique position in this county in that uh, when there's a victim and your department, your agency spends the largest amount of time with that victim through the process. When a crime is committed, a law enforcement agency's job is more or less done pretty quickly, actually, through the investigation, but your agency takes it over, and the court process takes a significant amount of time. It's a life-changing experience for that victim, and it's very isolating, and you have a remarkable victim witness program uh, and support program within, um, excuse me, victim support program within your agency. but. When it actually goes to court and it says the people of the state of California versus, what I think is very powerful about that is that for how isolating it is for that victim, you represent the entire state, not just the scan of the entire state. The entire people are behind that victim to support justice. And the people that have self-selected into the line of work where they could be making a significant higher wage if they chose to not do public service in law and they come into your agency with $200,000 in debt Plus, uh, says a lot about who it is that works in this agency to represent the people. And I, I know you take that very seriously, and, and the community doesn't always get to see the work that happens behind the scenes, and, and thank goodness most people aren't victims of crime within our community. Uh, but I appreciate your seriousness in which you take it and all your staff's seriousness, and, and, uh, uh, and you know, they're compensated by providing justice even more than they are through finances, but they believe in that, and that's a, a remarkable gift. We will we'll open it up for the community. If anybody would like to address us on this item, uh, seeing none, we'll bring it back to Supervisor Caput. Second. We have a motion for the recommended actions from Supervisor Caput and a second from Supervisor Coonerty. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. Just one, one quick brief comment. We always end by thanking uh, Community TV for filming us, and, and they do, but we should acknowledge the fact the passing of Peter McGettigan this week, sure. who was not just a long-term community TV uh, worker, but a, a great contributor to uh, a lot of things within our county. So I'd just like to acknowledge Peter McGettigan's passing and know that, we, that he's in our thoughts this week. Thank you. Thank you.